everybody. Welcome back to A View from Earth, brought to you by the Fist Planetarium at CU Boulder. We hope you're all doing well and staying safe. As with the rest of the university and many public spaces around the world, Fist Theater is closed to the public for the foreseeable future due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we are still so committed to bringing you astronomy and education that we started a whole host of free online offerings so that we can stay connected and keep bringing you the FISC content that you know and love, plus some new stuff like this podcast. So thanks for tuning in and learning with us here today. Uh, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum. I'm also a presenter and outreach coordinator at the FISC Planetarium. And my co-host Colin here. Colin, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm Colin. I am a, an undergrad at CU Boulder studying astronomy. I also work as a presenter at the Planetarium and, of course, as a co-host for this podcast. So today we are talking about asteroids. Big ones, small ones, some that they call dinosaur killers. We brought in two experts, uh, Kaya Sorley, who's a PhD student here at CU Boulder, and also Dr. Daniel Shiraz, who is an asteroid uh, expert, also has an asteroid named after him. So it's gonna be really fun. We've got some excerpts from those interviews to play for you. But first, the news. Today to present the news story of the episode with us is Joe Zader from Fisk. Joe, thanks for being here with us today. Could you uh, introduce yourself? Hi folks, I'm uh, Joe Zader. I'm a presenter at Fisk Planetarium, studying astronomy at CU Boulder. Uh, today we're talking about asteroids, so I thought I'd bring some news about a pretty cool and rare find from earlier this year that uh, really just got a little cooler and rarer in the last few days. Uh, so many people know that most asteroids, of course, are found between Mars and Jupiter, the region known as the asteroid belt. Uh, these number nearly a million now that have been cataloged, uh, but as you may also know from cheesy Hollywood movies, asteroids don't always stay in that belt. They get bumped, jostled, tugged by uh, gravity wells, all sorts of different things that can kind of send them elsewhere in the solar system, sometimes hurling towards Earth, like in the movies. Uh, well, some of these, uh, they can actually be found inside the orbit of Earth in a, in a stable orbit. And we found only about 20 or so of these. They are known as the Atiris, after the Native American goddess. And uh, quite a while, we believed that there should be or uh, asteroids that also orbit inside Venus. Uh, and these were then called the Vatiris, uh, which, of course, you know, why not just slap a V on there for Venus, going from Atiris to Vatiris, because astronomers are very creative at naming things. Uh, but anyway, we did find one of these, finally, in January of this year, that's inside, entirely inside the orbit of Venus. Uh, they, the astronomers then named this uh, 2020AV2, again, amazing at naming things uh, astronomers are. This was the first asteroid that is completely inside the solar system's second planet. Uh, we have other asteroids that of course will go in and out of the orbits on very highly elliptical orbits around the sun, but this one is stable inside of uh, Venus, at least for now. Uh, finding this of course was a major challenge, not just because of the size of the asteroid, but uh, same reason we, that you have probably seen Jupiter and Saturn in the night sky far more often than you've seen Mercury, Mercury and Venus. Uh, they're inside of Earth's orbit, so they always appear close to the sun and only visible really for a short period at dawn and dusk. Uh, that makes it, so finding a tiny little rock like that uh, floating near a huge light source, the sun, exceedingly tough. Uh, scientists love a good challenge though, hunting down a mystery. And now of course, well, we do have at least one of these materials we do know exist. Now, of course that I think is uh, kind of cool in its own right, uh, but just last week, uh, a new study was released that looked at this rare asteroid in more depth and using these wonders of spectroscopy we have, astronomers unlocked some of this treasure trove of data that can be found in light. In this case, uh, the light uh, that reflected off of this asteroid, it showed a chemical fingerprint that we've been waiting and hoping to see in abundance for a long time. This is something called olivine. And though that might sound like a cooking ingredient, it's actually a mineral that you can find in the mantle of different planetary bodies, uh, including the Earth. So what does that mean and why is it interesting? Well, if further studies pan out, and it's not just a little dusting of olivine that's on the surface that they detected, that would mean that this asteroid could actually be another missing puzzle piece in our understanding of the formation of different star systems, including our own. Uh, remember I mentioned before how we know about a million asteroids? Uh, well, of those, we've only seen about three dozen that have olivine in any kind of abundance. 
and we expect to see lots and lots and lots and lots of them. And that's because when these asteroids formed from pulverized planetesimals that were forming, if they were large enough, they could actually be formed with different layers, a core, a mantle, a crust like the Earth. And when then these got smashed around and uh, like billiard balls around the uh, solar system, that should have ejected a whole lot of mantle or olivine rich rocks. And it's possible that this newfound asteroid uh, not only led us to finding the first of the Viterian asteroids, hopefully many more in the future, but it could also be the first of the missing mantle asteroids that we've kind of thought are out there for a while and we're hoping there are a bunch more out there that can be found. So. In my opinion, it's uh, some very cool stuff and neat news in the world of asteroids. So this mineral that is interesting is called olivine? Yes. Is that Olive. right? Am I hearing that right? Olivine. Okay. And I believe that's how to pronounce it. I, I, I found someone else pronouncing it that way, so I figure that's correct. Hey, it we'll go with that. Olivine. <laughs> oh, <you know. laughs> Yeah, it's kind of a cool sounding uh, mineral, but uh, yeah, it's, it's something that's really just formed uh, or captured in the mantle as, uh, uh, as these planetary bodies, uh, what's called differentiation, as gravity pulls you know, different dense materials in, sort of settles in and the, ma the mantle is in the middle there in these planetary bodies. So there should be lots of it out there. And when right. these planetesimals got blown apart, you know, there should be lots of it floating around. And it's possible, uh, some think that uh, one of the reasons we don't find it as much is they, uh, most of it is very small, um, very small rocks, even smaller than that, you know, mini sure. mountain of one and a half kilometers, just because a lot of the asteroids, they're from the core, and it's the real heavy metal where it kind of stays intact a little bit better. Something like the mantle can break apart a lot more easily. So it might be very small dustings everywhere and uh, hard to find that way too then. Well, it's yeah, a, olivine is one of the main things that makes up uh, the basalts that come out of volcanoes here on Earth. So if you've ever like picked up a lava rock and seen how crumbly it is, that's essentially what it is. And that's if it ran into something, yeah, you'd end up with just dust. Yeah. It'll just break apart. Yeah, it makes sense. After you know, four and a half billion years of that, it's uh, a lot of dust instead of rocks, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, that would explain how we often see those metallic cores of differentiated bodies. You know, if you ever have seen, like at Fisk in the lobby, we have, uh, what is it? Is it nickel and iron? Uh, right. a, a meteorite. It's this huge chunk of metal. And that, I imagine, would kind of stick together more readily than these kind of crumbly minerals would. So that kind of explains that, that discrepancy in what we see. Yeah, well said. <laughs> Absolutely does. You also find a lot of olivine in the volcanic plains on the moon. Ooh, okay. Again, because of the, 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 the volcanic rock, that makes sense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very nice. Right. I learned well, more about thank olivine you so much for... that I've never known. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joe, thanks so much for uh, giving us the news today. That was super interesting. So we really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much, Colin. It's a pleasure being here and thanks for having me. So now we are speaking with Kaya Sorley. Kaya is a graduate student at CU. She specializes in modeling and observing of near-Earth objects, or NEOs, things like comets and asteroids. Uh, as a member of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory's Planetary Defense Team, Kaya has participated in government seminars on global security and understands not only how NEOs could threaten life here on Earth, but also what we could do about it. So thanks for joining us, Kaya. Yeah, thank you for having me. We're excited to chat with you. So we figured we'd start with probably the easy, obvious question. What is an NEO? So an NEO is, it's an abbreviation because in space and in astronomy, we love those. And it basically stands for near Earth object. And that can fall into two different categories, roughly asteroids or comets. And for a lot of people, they don't, there's not a huge differentiation between those, but uh, asteroids are kind of what most people think of when they think of things that could hit the Earth. If you look at most movies, it's usually an asteroid. It's a big, rocky object, um, metallic or kind of dust that's all gathered together. And they can range in size from really small, like little tiny, basically pebbles or rocks, and that might be what you see as shooting stars at night, up to things that are almost dwarf planets, like Ceres that are a couple hundred kilometers across. So. Asteroids, though they are far more numerous, are actually quite possibly not, not as dangerous as the alternative, which are comets. And comets are really dangerous because even though they're rarer, every single one of them is what we call a dinosaur killer. And that is quite literally a term that's used in the community. 
um, because every single comet is at least several kilometers across. And a comet can kind of be thought of as like a dirty, dusty snowball. It's a ball, it's a whole thing that's just ice, dust, and it can be different types of ice. But that's also why as a comet gets close enough to the sun, it starts to sublimate and we get that big, beautiful, long tail that you're used to seeing in movies and pictures and everything like that. But roughly kind of those, there's some uh, arguments about things that might fall into both categories that have been starting to emerge over the last couple of years. But um, for the most part, NEOs kind of fall into those two categories. Easy enough. I love Please, the technical astronomy terminology of dinosaur killers. We also have words like <laughs> spaghettification, which is technical terminology. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, there's the funny, the, the hard time that astronomers can always give to people like biologists to say, well, their most popular word is 10 syllables long, deoxyribonucleic acid. And mm -hmm. we refer to things that kill dinosaurs as dinosaur killers. Formally. It gets the point across. It, really it does. does. It's the it one does. thing that that Hollywood can't make more dramatic than it actually is. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very true. Well, speaking of Hollywood, we often see in movies like, and we're literally talking about dinosaur killers. We often talk about these these near Earth objects, NEOs, hitting the Earth, um, and that's kind of something that you know we think about because. It's one of those things where, you know, that could be a very scary and catastrophic event. Um, and, it, you know, it sounds like you have done, you know, quite a bit of thinking on this subject um, and work on, you know, what, okay, what does this whole situation look like? How can we deal with this? What do we do? So, you know, from your perspective and what you've seen, is the government or space, are space scientists, astronomers concerned at all about asteroids hitting the Earth or comets? Um, and if that's the case, you know, how, what do we do, you know, in, in a scenario where, where that could happen? Excellent question. Um, so not to freak anyone out, but yes, we, that is something we're concerned about. Um, I'll say this, it's not a likely event, but it's far more likely than a lot of people realize. That being said, it is quite possibly the only mass extinction event that we might be able to stop, which is quite insane if you really think about it. Um, so when we look at stopping asteroids and comets, if you think about the movies like Deep Impact and Armageddon, it's, they, they see the object like 14 days in advance, right? If that happens, I'm sorry, we're in deep trouble. But that luckily that's not usually the case. So we get hit by stuff every single day. And most of it just burns up in the atmosphere. Occasionally, something will make it through. Like if you look at 2013 in Russia, Chelyabinsk, um, it was hit by an asteroid that was in the order of a couple tens of meters across. And it didn't actually even make it all the way to the ground. It made it through the atmosphere and air bursted. And most of the damage was actually done because people were looking at it up against glass and then the glass blew out. So the thing is, we won't ever be able to stop all of them. But the nice thing is, especially with asteroids, we actually know where pretty much all of the dinosaur killers are, and every year we learn more. There's entire surveys like Atlas in Hawaii and NeoWise that are dedicated almost entirely to finding objects that could, that could pose a threat to the Earth now or in the future. So we actually know where a lot of them are. So that's a really good sign because we actually know that they're, like, we already know in 2029 an asteroid called Apophis is going to come within the Earth and Moon distance but it's not going to hit. And so as everything develops, as our knowledge of where asteroids are develops, of how their orbits progress develop, we can actually map out what's a threat and what's not. So that's, the real, so that's some of the really good news. Um, comets, like I was saying beforehand, are a little bit more dangerous, and that's for a couple different reasons. They're really, really big. They move very quickly. Um, we know almost nothing about their interiors. And also, um, we don't really have much warning time with them often. So I've worked with comets before where we discovered it and a few months later across the Earth orbital. If you compare that to asteroids where we kind of know where everything is at least 10 years in advance, anything that could cause real damage, um, and a comet could really take us by surprise. And so we kind of have to be prepared for that or at least think of that when we're trying to figure out ways to stop these objects from hitting the Earth. And right now, there's kind of two primary ways that we would go about 
deflecting these objects. And they fall into the nuclear side and what's called the kinematic impact side. And there's a lot of other really cool ways that people have hypothesized, like laser bees and gravity tractors, which I am more than happy to talk about if anyone wants to go sci-fi. But right now they're really just theoretical. They're not something that we would actually implement. So if we look at nuclear, we actually literally would take a nuclear device, send it up into space and detonate. But you don't actually want to blow the object up. Because so it's not you, Armageddon. We don't do not Armageddon. Armageddon. Okay. No. Yeah. <laughs> because if you think about it, if you have something like a comet that's a, or an asteroid that's a couple kilometers across, you go and you blow it up and now you have seven mini comets that are all headed towards Earth on unknown trajectories. Not ideal. So what you actually want to do is go up, if this is the comet, sorry, I probably should describe this as, <laughs> I should probably shouldn't describe this visually. If you have a comet, you actually want to detonate the weapon or the device away from it. And then what you do is the actual blast will cause the surface of the comet or asteroid to shoot off. And that will actually give you a momentum kick. Because if you think about it, as something gets shot off the surface of an asteroid, it's going to push the other direction. And what you're just trying to do is move the orbit enough that it misses the Earth. And that doesn't take a lot if it's a far away object. So, so nukes are really good for something where it's a little bit closer actually, where it's a really big object so that you can really just go at it. But let's say that it's something where it's a really delicate material like a comet, or let's say it's something where we, we have a long time to go before it's gonna hit. As you might imagine, it's not popular to send nukes into space. We have very few international laws as a, as a global community, and one of them is no nukes in space. Uh, from the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. So the more popular option is actually something called kinematic impaction. And what that basically is, it's a fancy term for hitting these objects with a battering ram. And that's actually kind of what I specialized in. And it literally means that we would take an impactor and ram it into the object at high speeds. We're talking 10 plus kilometers per second. And you try to move it just enough that it misses Earth. So that's good if the object is small, compact, um, or if we have a really long time, like 10 plus years, you want to hit it with kinematic impactor first. Um, yeah, so those are kind of the two primary ways of doing it. And depending on the object and what we know about it, we would vacillate between those two. But those are kind of the prepared ways that you would go cool. about it. Cool. That, I think, is an excellent introduction to <laughs> We're, we're talking about. I want to ask you a little bit about what you do specifically because you're really big into modeling of asteroids and comets and things. Can you tell us a little bit about kind of what you do and what it's used for? So what I'm basically doing is trying to learn how temperature and radiation pressure flux from the sun can impact not only the asteroids as they currently are with their composition and their heat and everything else, but also maybe how they can change their orbits and how it could have led to asteroids spinning really fast, like spinning faster or moving apart and moving together. Because there's evidence that pretty much every near Earth asteroid exists in a binary multiple times um, during its lifetime. And that can really affect orbital dynamics. And from a planetary defense point of view, it could also affect what their orbits are and how they could pose a threat to Earth. So when you're saying that it's, you know, there's probably a lot of reasons why this is really hard or impossible for us to model here on Earth. Like, I, I can't think of a way that we could actually, like, make an artificial binary asteroid system or something yeah. like that. Anti-gravity room, of course. Oh, of right. obviously. Right, 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 yeah. <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> No, that's actually posed a really big challenge um, to the planetary defense community and just in general, any space-based impact. You can do experiments here. Like we have, uh, you can actually perform scaled impacts and things here, but you always have things like gravity and you've got, you don't know if you have the right materials and there's really no substitute for doing it in space if you can do it. So you're totally right. We can't really recreate it except for with modeling. And even with modeling, we have to test it. So you have to make sure that what you're doing is right, that it actually reflects what's happening in nature. And that's a huge part of science. It's something you have to do in 
every single field. You have to make a hypothesis, you have to test it, you have to see if it actually compares with what's happening, if it explains what's going on. So in this case, we have models. We have tried to model what impacts look like and what we would do, but we actually really want to do it in space. We want to try it out in space. And so when I talk about things like that DART test, the when we're going to, going to impact a, um, a mini asteroid, we're going to actually be able to test a lot of what we've been hoping is the solution to stopping things, which is fantastic. I mean, imagine a hundred years ago, who would have thought that we could have stopped maybe an asteroid headed for the earth. So though it's really kind of scary, and I know that a lot of people will probably be a little bit uneasy about some of this, just really it, the fact that we can do it and we might actually be able to stop it, and I think we have a good shot at doing it, is pretty incredible. It's really a testament to modern astronomy and engineering and everything else that this is a possibility and we've got a really good chance at saving the world. That's pretty exciting. <laughs> <laughs> That's gotta feel good though, like as a scientist, the chance to save the world. Yeah, very much. Although sometimes I read sci-fi books and there's like an Armageddon sequence. I'm like, oh, so this is what happens if I don't do my job correctly. Good to know. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> But we are not done yet because we are going to do our uh, new favorite thing that we're doing. We're calling it Capcom Q&A, where we have questions submitted by the public. And we're going to quiz you on a couple of things that people from our audience want to know. All right. So our next question is one that I get all the time. Um, what is the difference between an asteroid, a meteor, and a meteorite? Size. <laughs> Almost <laughs> entirely. Um, all meteors and meteorites are, well, they're, all they're all in the asteroid family. Um, but a meteorite is basically something that hits the, well, so a meteor, everything's an asteroid. Everything's a space rock for all intents and purposes. But a meteor is basically something that hits the atmosphere and you might see it as a shooting star, and a meteorite is something that makes it all the way to the bottom. Um, so if you have, if you've ever seen like pieces, if someone's ever passed around a piece of meteorite, that means that it actually made it all the way to the earth. Um, a meteor mostly just blows up in transit, so that's something where you might get a big air burst or something like that, but there's not necessarily like shrapnel on the ground. An asteroid is, they're all asteroids until they hit an atmosphere, basically. And then usually, I say size because we, we, t we tend to call these things like shooting stars and things like that. You wouldn't really call one that was really, really big a shooting star. You'd probably still call it an asteroid, but you're just kind of, it basically just depends on if it makes it to an atmosphere and if it makes it to the ground. So on the subject of things hitting the ground, another one of the questions that we got is, have we as humans ever observed an asteroid hit a planet and that's what the question is have we seen an asteroid hit a planet and I'll, I'll interpret that as maybe have we seen an asteroid hit another planet that's not earth do we see well, we've, we've seen them hit here <laughs> yeah right right yeah. no but yeah, we actually have yeah um in fact we've actually also seen a comet hit another planet so in i want to say it was the 90s a comet uh i think was that shoemaker levy Really with funny names um hit jupiter and it caused it was really really cool if you're listening and haven't seen pictures i would definitely recommend looking up that event because it's really really fascinating um so we actually got to see comet hit a gas giant which was potentially the coolest <laughs> scenario um but we have also seen little things hit um kind of all over the solar system or alternatively we've also seen fresh craters even if we didn't necessarily see the impact um, because often you can see on these planets how new a crater is depending on the color. It'll be redder or lighter or something like that. So we have seen things hit. Um, we actually have another member of our group who observes small little flashes on the moon even. Um, so we have seen that. We, I don't think we've seen a really large one, at least not during the period of modern observing. Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong on that if you know. But um, I don't think we have. I think sh no. the, the comet impact on Jupiter was pretty much the climactic event in terms of impacts. Yeah, that was a big deal. I think if something, if something really big like that happened, we probably would have heard about it by now. 
All right, and our last question from the public here is a pretty simple one, I think. How are asteroids made? Where do asteroids come from? Great question. Um, something we're actually still working on, but the general belief is that you, when, you when, when the solar system was starting out, it kind of started as a giant cloud of dust and gas. And of course, at the center, we have the sun growing and uh, eventually igniting and turning into the sun as we know it now. But you have all this other dust and everything out in the solar system. And if you have a little bit of gravitational perturbation, that dust can start to collapse into, and at the beginning, you might get little tiny pebbles or just barely there um, dust collections. But because of gravity, those things start to collide. They start to come together. And that results in larger and larger pieces that eventually kind of collide and grow. And um, what we call these are basically rubble pile asteroids, because it's literally like you're taking dust rubble and it's combining, it's coalescing under its own gravity. And when we look at the kind of solar system as it exists now, we can actually still see these. So there's lots of different, we've visited some of them or are going to visit. Um, there's lots of asteroids that are just the product of rubble piles that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, theoretically, if it can get big enough that it can attract enough to actually cause the, to gain, if, if, if an asteroid can attract enough stuff that there's enough pressure at its center to start to heat up and basically start liquefying, then you can start to get metallic or planetary cores. So if you actually look at in the asteroid belt, there's pieces from either failed planets, what we called failed planetoids, um, or from things that were scooped off, like there was a giant impact on Vespa, which is another dwarf or large asteroid dwarf planet sort of thing in the asteroid belt. And we can find pieces of Vespa scattered throughout the asteroid um, belt that tend to be more metallic because there was enough pressure that they actually turned metallic. So asteroids can kind of broadly be categorized into rubble pile where it was just, the, just everything gathering under gravity. It's a very weak, but they can get pretty large um, asteroid or if it gets hot and dense enough that it actually turns metallic, then you can literally get hunks of metal flying through space. Well, awesome. Kaya, thanks so much for, you know, getting on here and chatting with us about, about asteroids and planetary defense. It was really cool to hear your story and your perspectives on a lot of these things. So we really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Dr. Daniel Shears is a distinguished professor of aerospace, and of aerospace engineering at CU, specializing in astrodynamics and satellite navigation. Dr. Shears has also done work for JPL, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, and received rewards from NASA for his group's work on an asteroid redirect mission concept. Uh, he is the recipient of numerous awards for publications on astrodynamics. In fact, he is so recognized in the field that you have an asteroid named after you, Dan. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds so, impressive. <laughs> it is. No, that's great. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, and we'll jump right in to our conversation with you about asteroids. I did want to ask, though, you know, we have, we've got the main asteroid belt, we've got those Trojans, and we talked last week with uh, Dr. Baganal about the, the Kuiper belt and all the stuff that's way, way out right. there. Do we ever see any extrasolar asteroids? I know we had Oumuamua that came through our solar system real quick uh, a year or so ago. Is that, do we see more of those or do we, I think it's probably really hard to like see some around and see asteroids around another star like we do with exoplanets or something like that. Well, yeah, so, so uh, uh, the good multi-level question there. So, in terms of these interstellar interlopers, uh, I think we, we have definitely two that I know of. Maybe there's some additional ones. They don't make as the, the press, it's not my area, and the press isn't after the first couple, you know, people don't cover it as much. But, but those are, the, the, those have only been seen quite, quite recently. Uh, the Uomua and I think Borisov was another one that, that occurred uh, within the last year or so. And I, be, I believe both of those had some, well, Wamua was interesting because I don't think they saw a coma at all. Yet they were able to very precisely track its orbit 
And from that, they were able to tell that it was emitting gas. Because when, when a comet emits gas, it gives it a little, looks like a little jet on it. And it changes its, its orbit a little. And they were actually able to tell that, yeah, well, you know, we didn't see anything, but something was coming off the surface. So it was jetting this Oumuamua, and it was basically accelerating it as it went through through our solar system. This is why some people say, oh, it's a million crap. But 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 it that that doesn't really hold water. Um, it's uh, uh, it, it 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 was an object that was really sublimating from from its surface. Um, so there, this is another classification quandary, right? Uh, we didn't see anything. It was it looked like an asteroid, say. Yet uh, we know that it's uh, it was primitive. We could tell it was primitive from the, the other sort of astronomical observations of it, and it was obviously losing material. We just couldn't see it because uh, it was being jetted along. Um, and and there, I, I I guess they threw up their hands and said, "Well, we don't have to worry about it. We'll just make a whole new classification, interstellar." Uh, so so that that solved that problem. So when oh. we thought, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and then getting to your other question about can we see asteroids or small bodies, comets, or you know, interstellar interstellars around other star systems? And the answer is um, yes and no. So we, we can't, you know, resolve a small asteroid around a distant solar system. Okay, so you know some of the techniques we have, you know, they can actually start to, you know, to 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 see or have some real constraints on planets and their sizes, and all that. You know, these primitive bodies tend to be very small because they are sort of this detritus, this leftover from the formation. But uh, uh, and, and we all know this: if you get enough dust together, if you get enough of these small bodies together, especially if they're very densely packed, you can see that because you see the light scattering from all the smaller particles. This is why we can see Saturn's rings. You know, the individual bodies are tiny. We, we can't resolve them, but all that light is being scattered. And, and, and so, so there are uh, observations of uh, extrasolar systems where they can say, yeah, okay, this looks like it's a comet belt. This looks like it's an asteroid belt that's, you know, getting, getting ground up. Uh, and, and, and they can actually refine these techniques even more and say, well, we see this type of light being absorbed. We think, therefore, that there's, you know, this distribution of small asteroids or dust, if you will, around the star absorbing all these materials or uh, 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 absorbing that, that radiation. That is so cool. <laughs> Assuming that we could resolve you know, or, or infer the existence of asteroid and comet-like bodies, but around other stars, would we just call them exo-asteroids and exo-comets, or would they have some other way that we refer to them? What do you think about that? Man, I, I don't know. I, it would probably follow the planetary guidelines, but I don't even understand what the planetary guidelines are. <laughs> so I... My, my, my whole career, I've sort of been stuck in, stuck in the mud in, a, in, our, in our own solar system. Sure, right. <laughs> outside of it, so to speak. Um, but yeah, I, I, that seems like a rational approach. Okay. Which means we're probably not doing that. Right, <laughs> right. well, yeah. Um, speaking of, so, you know, we're living here on Earth. In our solar system, this is where everything that we can see is. This is where you do, well, it sounds like all of your work. Um, and I think that a lot of, to loop Star Wars back into the conversation, because that's fun, I think that, you know, in, in sci-fi especially, but just when we talk about asteroids, the question always comes up, what about Earth getting hit by asteroids? What about this idea of something, you know, from space hitting Earth, and it's huge, and it causes all sorts of problems? Is, like, what, what are we actually looking at when, you know, when we kind of have these questions or when sci-fi movies or, or TV shows, you know, make this event happen. Oh, sorry. Uh, is that just, is that, you know, silly or, or what are your thoughts on the dangers of, of asteroids hitting the earth? Yeah, well, to be honest, it happens all the time, every day. 
Um, you know, any shooting star you see is an asteroid hitting the Earth. Okay. Okay. Um, or a cometary dust particle hitting the Earth. <coughs> the thing is, um, the smaller in size you go, the more frequently you are hit by these. Because uh, also, in principle, the smaller in size you go, the more bodies there are of that size. Okay. When we go to the planets, there's only what eight now. <laughs> You know, we go into asteroids uh, that, that are larger than a couple hundred kilometers. There's, you know, a few thousands. And, you know, as you go smaller and smaller, you get astronomical numbers of these little dust particles and all that. So they are hitting us all the time. Uh, and uh, we also know from our own geological record uh, and, and uh, uh, evolutionary record and, and the like, that occasionally larger ones hit us as well. There's lots of craters around the Earth. Uh, the only way you could form them is from an extraterrestrial, you know, a meteor coming in and smack, you know, smacking the Earth, making these big holes. Um, uh, we have a pretty good idea of what happened to the dinosaur. Uh, and, and there's even more and more very interesting research being done on that chick, uh, I never get it, the, the big dinosaur killing impact from, uh, uh, from a long time ago. Um, uh, you know, just more and more evidence in our uh, in our geological time of what happened. So it, it definitely happens. Um, and in fact, it, it's a good segue, well, not a segue, but just an aside, that there's actually other classes or other places where we find an asteroid. And we talked about the main belt, Trojans, and we can go out into the Kuiper belt and beyond. There's also a class of asteroids called near-Earth asteroids. Uh, and, and, or if you want to include comets, we call them near-Earth objects, because they could be comets or asteroids. We don't always know what they are. And these are bodies, small bodies, that have been, so to speak, scattered into the inner solar system. Uh, just like comets are scattered into the inner solar system, they come close to the sun, they make all this light, uh, all this dust. That happens to asteroids a lot, too. And in fact, it's this class of body these near-Earth asteroids, and that loosely uh, it's defined by bodies whose orbit goes uh, close to or through one astronomical unit, meaning that there's a possibility that they could hit the Earth, okay? Because, you know, the first requirement, if you want a celestial body to hit the Earth, it first has to somehow get to 1 AU from the Sun, right? Because that's where we are all the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so there are this, this, this other class of bodies, the NEO, that uh, cross the Earth's orbit. And some of them, uh, we know, come very close to the Earth's orbit. And in fact, you know, if, if, if you have a, you know, one of these internet uh, news feeds that covers science, you know, every month at least, you know, oh, a big asteroid comes closer than the moon or, you know, pumpkin-shaped asteroid or skull-faced asteroid on Halloween, you know. Um, all, all these very cool asteroids that are always flying by us. Those are all NEOs. And if they can come that close to us, they can also hit us, okay? Um, uh, a lot of these, if they hit us, you know, uh, uh, in fact, you, you hear about meteorite falls all the time. A lot of times it's not a big deal, okay? But, you know, as, as you make those asteroids bigger and bigger, uh, you know, you would want to be further and further from where it might hit on the surface of the Earth. And, and in fact, there's sort of a, and, and none of these numbers are very precise, but there's sort of a rule of, rule of thumb, you know, if, if you get up to asteroids that are maybe 100 meters across, uh, like a, a, a football field size, those can actually create a lot of damage if something that big would hit the earth and if you hit it in the middle of the city or you know uh, some other populated area yeah that, that wouldn't be good you know you're getting into uh something like a tunguska size event and i don't know if you've ever covered tunguska on your show but it's could you it's summarize it really quick for us yeah long uh, about 100 years ago in the middle of nowhere in siberia something blew up in the sky and flattened I don't know how many uh, uh, thousands, millions of acres of forest. And people have figured out that it was probably a, a, either a comet or an asteroid that entered in 
over the over Siberia. And actually, before it actually even hit the ground, it sort of exploded in the middle of the sky and, and, and just created this huge devastation. Uh, uh, but no one was there. Or, you know, I, I think there was a small handful of people that, that were killed by it. Um, and, and, you know, to, to take it down a step, you can remember uh, Chelyabinsk a few years ago. That's the one in everyone's car, you know, all, all those car videos, people driving around, and you see this thing coming through the sky. And then like a minute later, bam, you know, there's a sonic wave and all the glass scatters everywhere in the city. Okay, so, so then that's something that's even a little bit smaller, probably tens, several tens of meters across. And, and so you can sort of scale that up and you realize, yeah, the bigger and bigger these get, the bigger the destruction would be. Luckily, the bigger they get, the fewer of them there are as well. Um, and, and when you get into something the size of the, what we call the dinosaur killer, um, you have to get up pretty large, you know, uh, on the order of uh, a, a few kilometers across. And, and, and this sort of, uh, really a couple of decades ago, this drove a lot of activity or started a lot of activity uh, of, of us, um, not me personally, but the people in the community. Well, and one of the things that I kind of wanted to ask you about too is, you know, it's, we've talked about sending things into space to rendezvous and destroy these asteroids, but we're also now sending things out to take samples from these asteroids and bring them back. So we've got tons of sample return missions that are going on now. Um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about some of that and like what kind of things that we can learn from these sample returns? Yeah, that, that, that's a, a great question. Um, yeah, if you really think about it, we have a lot of samples of, as of asteroids on the Earth. Because every time a meteorite hits or a meteor hits and, becomes, uh, and, and lands on the surface of the Earth and someone picks it up, well, we've got a sample, right? Now, um, and when we look at all the samples that we have, though, we see that the, the sample is highly biased towards things that are tough and it can make it through the atmosphere at several kilometers per second without completely being destroyed or burning up. So, so um, some of the initial sample missions that we've had were just to get some samples and compare it with meteorites uh, uh, and, 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 and the like in order to you know, close the loop is what we see in space, really the stuff that we're picking up off the surface of the Earth. And, and some early missions really nailed that down. Yes, it is. So we were able to say, oh, okay, so we know we have space stuff on the Earth. But now we're going to mission, you know, we have missions to um, the asteroid Bennu and Ryugu, that's the target of the Japanese Hayabusa 2 mission. And the material from these asteroids generally doesn't survive going through the Earth's atmosphere. So, so if a little bit of Bennu entered the Earth's atmosphere as a, as, as a meteor, it would probably break apart, burn, you know, maybe burn up or just break apart, become a little dust, which we can't then track and pick up and all that, and just settle down to the surface of the Earth because it's so weak, so fragile, so primitive. And, and we think the same thing is true with comets as well. Um, they tend to be uh, less strong. They're, they're very uh, porous. Um, so, so that when we have, you know, uh, 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 small bits of comets and the like uh, entering the earth, they tend to become little particles, dust particles, and they sort of gently float down. So with our sample missions that we're doing now, we're actually trying to get material that we don't see on the surface of the earth because it gets filtered out. Uh, so either very primitive asteroids that haven't gone through the strengthening process of being in the, inside of the inner core of a larger protoplanet, or cometary bodies uh, where there's just a bunch of ice and, and, and the like that's never been heated up. You know, if you bring that comet to one of you so they can hit the Earth, by the time it gets to one of you, it's spewing all of its stuff out all, all, all over the place and really changing and going through a transformation. So, so there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, there's a big wish for comet sample return. We don't have any missions to do that right now, but it's a perennial 
uh, mission of interest or the proposed uh, again and again. And right now we do have these, these missions to these primitive bodies. And once we get that material back and in the lab, it's really gonna give us a lot of insight into what these asteroids are truly made out of, given, and, and, and then also give us insight into what the early chemistry of the solar system was, what was going on four billion years ago. Well, and then I have to follow that up by asking the, the second question that we always get. Once we know what's on these asteroids, how practical is it for us to go and try to mine this material and make use of that? Is that a thing that we should even be considering? Are there all sorts of other implications to this sort of process that we need to worry about? Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating question. And, and, you know, I've read many science fiction books about it, right? But yeah. how real is it? Uh, how real could it be? And, and there, there are some aspects of it that, that could, um, you know, that do make sense. I don't think our, our infrastructure is there yet for us to really make it practical to go and get materials from an asteroid. Um, but but when, when you really do a cost-benefit analysis, what actually turns out to be, uh, um, you know, maybe the most valuable thing on these asteroids is this plain old water. Because um, if you think about it, uh, uh, you know, if, if you can somehow extract water out of an asteroid, and some of these primitive asteroids uh, should have a fair amount of water in them, not uh, lakes or anything like that, but just in their chemistry, and you might be able to sort of fractionate it and pull out that material. Once you have water, if you have energy, you can separate it into hydrogen and oxygen. And then if you want to use it as a, a thruster, you can then combine the hydrogen and oxygen, you know, get a, a or, or, or somehow use that as a propellant to start pushing yourself around the solar system. So there are materials that we could use as resources in space. There's also a big drive to figure out how easily accessible the water on the moon is. Um, because it, it has been documented that there is water somewhere up in the poles they don't really understand how that's distributed around, you know, what chemical form it's in and all that. But if, you know, if you can access that, then suddenly you have, a, you know, even if the astronauts can't drink it, they can make, they can use it to actually, you know, uh, uh, create other materials or, you know, make a, a water shield to protect yourself against cosmic rays, because uh, water is a pretty good insulator there. Um, so, so there are a lot of uses for this material. Uh, and, and, but the first step is actually documenting that it's there and that it's accessible, okay? And in some sense, these missions, the sample return missions, missions to the uh, uh, North Pole of the Moon, um, listen, I actually, one of the full surface, I, I don't know the moon, but, um, the, uh, I, you know, what they're doing is they're sort of scoping out the situation is, you know, is, are these resources that we can actually somewhat easily access? If the answer is yes, you know, then it really makes sense to start uh, developing or thinking about how might you get that material? You know, is it, is it of any use to you at the asteroid or, or you know, what, what would make it economically viable? Uh, and, and then you can go down that whole path. There are companies that are thinking about these things, but I, I don't think, and I might be proven wrong, I'm going to be great if I were, I don't think anyone's going to launch a mining mission to an asteroid anytime soon. But the, there certainly are groups of people that are, that, you know, that are thinking far into the future and starting to figure out, you know, what can we do now to make this a reality um, in the future. Very cool. Well, uh, Daniel Shears, Dr. Daniel Shears, thank you so much for, for being with us today on, uh, on this episode of A View from Earth. I don't know if we ever actually told you. That's the name of our podcast, by the way. When I first reached out, we didn't know it. Now we do. It's A View from Earth because we're looking out into the solar system from here on Earth with experts like yourself. So thanks so much for, for joining us, being with us today. And uh, hopefully we can chat again in the future. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Colin and, and Tara, uh, thanks so much. Uh, great questions, and it's always great to talk about these things. Uh, so I'm uh, 
Thank you very much for having me. Be happy to talk to you again. All right, and that concludes this episode of A View from Earth. We'd like to thank our guests, uh, Kaya Sorley and Dr. Daniel Shears again for uh, giving us their time. Um, And I also want to remind all of our listeners that if either of those or both of those interviews were exceedingly intriguing to you, you can check out the full extended uh, editions of those interviews on our YouTube and SoundCloud accounts. Um, And uh, if if you're continued to be interested, nope, I'm going to retake that. And that concludes our episode of A View from Earth for this week. Uh, We'd like to thank our guests, Kaya Sorley and Dr. Daniel Shears, again, for giving us their time. And uh, I'd like to remind our listeners that uh, we have the extended interviews on our YouTube and SoundCloud accounts. So if you want to check out, you know, the longer version of those interviews um, that aren't edited down so they fit into our little time slot, then uh, you can check those out there. Uh, And next week, we'll be talking about exoplanets. Um, So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, our, our guests are Jessica Libby Roberts and Dr. Zach Berta Thompson. We'll talk about something called super puffs, which are basically planets that have the same density as cotton candy. Um, and we'll also look a bit into uh, the world of exoplanet research and perhaps some uh, communication with the general public about science. So uh, I, that will be a lot of fun. Uh, if you have any questions, we always like to pass those on to our experts. So uh, give us uh, a visit at colorado.edu forward slash FISC. Um, and you can find a little Q&A bin there, or you can just email us at fiskpodcast at colorado.edu. Make sure to subscribe, or if you're on YouTube, like and comment uh, so that you stay up to date with our podcast. Uh, This podcast is on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and uh, we really appreciate you uh, giving us your time and checking out our podcast. We'll see you next week. 